Okay, uh, welcome to the lecture here. Uh, we're going to actually go back a little bit. We're going to go back to chapter three, I think, the last uh, section of chapter three, and we're going to talk about nomenclature. We'll get started here in just a second. Everybody get in. Okay, so uh, last time we did, uh, I think, finish up chapter five, where we're talking about uh, grams, moles, empirical formulas, uh, molecular formulas, how to calculate all that stuff. Uh, so remember, basic steps for the empirical formula, convert uh, grams into moles, divide by the smallest, hopefully gives you a whole number. And obviously, if it does, that would be your empirical formula. If it doesn't give you a whole number, then uh, you do need to figure out a factor to multiply uh, everybody by to get to whole numbers. So you figure out the molecular formula, you pretty much need the empirical formula like we talked about last time. Uh, you need the molar mass of the empirical formula and you need the molar mass of the compound, which is usually given to you in the problems. And again, we take the molar mass of the compound divided by the empirical formula molar mass. And that usually will give you a factor by which you multiply the empirical formula by and that will get you to your molecular formula. So uh, any questions on any of that stuff before we kind of move on to the next topic? Okay, okay so like I said, uh, this is technically, I think, back to chapter three, the last section uh, in chapter three. So I think the rest of it obviously was the bonding stuff that we talked about uh, previously. So we're gonna talk about all kinds of uh, nomenclature, how to name everything here. Um, we're going to talk about ionic nomenclature, uh, covalent nomenclature, acids. Uh, so we're talking about a good majority of, of every type of nomenclature uh, that we will see. So let us start. That's a periodic table. Good conversation there. So uh, a couple of reminders on the periodic table, as you will see, and as we talked about before, I think it's a periodic table. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, a reminder that when we do talk about ions, which are some of the stuff that we uh, will cover, obviously, in the rest of this chapter, uh, everybody in group one, right, is a plus one type charge. Everybody in group two is a plus two charge. When we get down to group three, usually it's aluminum there that we're talking about. It's going to be a plus three charge. Then when we skip uh, group number four and kind of going backwards, our nonmetals above uh, the staircase there. Uh, group five minus three, group six minus two, and group seven minus one. So these are sort of fixed charges. Everybody there will pretty much have those charges no matter what the situation is. Um, as we talked about before, as we'll also see here, our transition metals and some guys even below our transition metals kind of in this region over here. Um, they can have a variety of charges. So they have sort of a variable charge uh, in this region. There is though three sort of exceptions to that. And that is zinc. Zinc, no matter what the situation is, will be plus two. Same thing with cadmium will also be plus two, no matter the situation. So again, although they are sort of uh, in the transition metal region, they do have sort of fixed charge. And if you kind of hang a left at cadmium, you'll head over to silver. And silver also has a fixed charge of plus one. So those sort of three exceptions in the transition metal region are guys that have pretty much a fixed charge in terms of their positive charge. Zinc and cadmium plus two, hang a left, and you're off to silver there with a plus one type charge. And this can be really important, obviously, in, in terms of uh, Ionic nomenclature, uh, when we have metals and non-metals that come together, and uh, really what sort of determines the different ways that you name them is sort of the metal. The metal is sort of the important guy uh, when you look at it. 
So let us uh, sort of talk a little bit about that. Another periodic table, okay, so I got lost with that one. Let's talk about our cations first. So cations, as we've talked about, I think in previous chapters as well, are positive ions. And they really are a result of a metal that loses an electron. So when a metal loses an electron, obviously it becomes positively charged. And that is what is known as a cation. When we name cations, if you just have the ion by itself, to name just the cation by itself, we pretty much just use the whole name of the metal. So uh, for example, if I had uh, K plus, that would be the potassium ion. If I had H plus, that would be the hydrogen ion. If I had uh, Ba2 plus, that would be our barium ion. Uh, Ag plus would be our silver ion. So cations are pretty straightforward in the sense that uh, the way you go about naming them is simply you just use the whole name, you put ion on it. If you're asked to write the formula for an ion, obviously it should include the charge, otherwise it's not an ion. So if you're asked to write the formula for a cation, you should always include the charge. Uh, if you're asked to write the formula for an anion, which is the negative ion that's in an ionic compound. And that is from really a non-metal that gains electrons. And in that particular case, when we go to name anions, we do uh, use the root of the name, but we do drop the last part and we put IDE at the end of the last part of the name. So if we had something like O2 minus, oxygen becomes the oxide, IDE ion. And three minus nitrogen becomes the nitride IDE ion, uh, Br minus, which would be bromine, becomes the bromide ion. Hydrogen, which is kind of unusual, can also go negative as well. So positive hydrogen is the hydrogen ion. Negative hydrogen there with a negative one charge is the hydride IDE ion. So negative guy, gets the IDE at the end of the name, uh, positive guy, which is our metal. We just simply use the entire name of, of the metal there when we name it. Other important things that we have perhaps touched upon as well, but just to review, whenever we sort of put an ionic compound together, which is what we're talking about here, An ionic compound, as we talked about with bonding, is always between a metal and a non-metal. And what we have going on there is a transfer of electrons, like we talked about in bonding, from the metal to the non-metal. And that is going to create our cation, which is positively charged or anion, which is negatively charged. And as we talked about with bonding, absolutely no sharing of electrons there. It's that electrostatic attraction that holds that together. And always when we write the formula or say the name, it always goes cation, positive guy, then negative. So a couple of things, when we do put these guys together, we put it together in a formula that gives us no charge overall. So for example, if I say NaCl, although this formula here has no charge, it is made up of two ions. It is made up of a sodium ion that has a plus one charge and a chloride ion that has a minus one charge. And when we put that together, again, we just need one of each 
kind of like we talked about with bonding, if you took something like calcium and put it together with fluoride, you get CaF2, and that's because calcium has a plus two, fluorine has a minus two, so when we put them together to get no charge, we need more of the fluorine for a grand total of two, which essentially means that we have a minus two and a positive two charge, everything balances out. So whenever we write the formula for an ionic compound, should never have a charge. All the positive and negative charges should balance each other out. And the purpose of that is what we talked about with bonding, really the purpose of that, uh, like we see with the calcium and the fluorine, when we talked about bonding is by having the extra fluorine there, it allows calcium to lose enough electrons to reach noble gas configuration. As we talked about, I think when we were talking about bonding, if that second fluorine was not there, calcium would only have the ability to lose one electron and it would not get itself to noble gas configuration and obviously would not be happy. So again, that's sort of the whole point of the bonding. Also sort of the whole point when we put these guys uh, together. Any questions on that so far? Yeah. So here's a table. Again, it kind of goes over what we were just talking about. If you are asked to write the cation formula, again, should have the charge included. And if it's a cation, whole name of the metal with the, I, uh, with the ion at the end of it in terms of the name. Uh, if it's a anion, it will have the negative charge should also be included if you're asked to write the formula for an anion. And again, we drop the last part of the name and add that IDE to it. So let's talk about the first type of compound that we're going to name and they're sometimes referred to as type 1 compounds and type 1 compounds is an ionic compound and it is between a metal and a non-metal and the same thing happens as we just talked about that metal is going to transfer that electrons over to the non-metal and always 100 percent of the time when you have a metal and a non-metal that come together really the most important one is always the metal so the most important one is always going to be the metal whenever you have that combination of a metal and a non-metal that come together. And what makes this sort of a type one compound is the metal is from group one, two, three, are it silver, zinc, or cadmium. And what all those metals basically have in common is what we were just talking about at the very beginning. They all have a fixed charge. They all have a fixed positive charge. So because they have a fixed positive charge, it makes naming these guys pretty straightforward. When you go to name type one compounds, you simply use the whole name of the metal. And then the non-metal, you drop the last part of the name and that's where you add your IDE. So whole name of the metal, drop the last part of the non-metal and put that IDE in there and you will have your, your name that you need. So for example, if we had, like we saw before, NACL, when we look at this, again, this is a metal, this is a non-metal, which tells you it's an ionic compound. Sodium is group one, which tells you it's a type one because it has a fixed charge. So basically, once we see that, we could just go right to the naming, whole name of the metal, sodium, last guy there, I guess the chlorine becomes chloride IDE at the end of it. Um, if we have CABR2, same thing here, we look at this, calcium is a metal, Br is a non-metal, calcium is group number two, which means it's a type one compound. So we proceed right to the name and we got calcium, whole name of the metal, and bromide on the back end. Now, both of these guys are made up of two ions, even though again, our formula does not have a charge. So again, the cation here would be our sodium ion. The anion here would be our chloride ion. And on this side, our cation would be our calcium with a plus two. 
and our bromide would be our anion, which would be minus one. Now, a very important thing to note for our type one compound here, and what people always wanna do is they see this two and they decide, hey, I should use some prefixes because it seems like the right thing to do. And it definitely is not the right thing to do. As you can see, no prefix, nothing there. It doesn't matter if that's like a 422 bromines at the end, it would still just be called bromide at the end. So no prefixes or anything that's used here with a type one compound, simply whole name of the metal and um, IDE for our non-metal in that particular case. Any questions on that there? And here's a much prettier picture of what I was drawing before of our fixed charges. Again, uh, right around here, also our fixed charges, zinc plus two, cadmium plus two, and silver plus one in that case. So all these guys have fixed one. These are all pretty much our type one guys. If we have a metal that's pretty much any of those guys uh, will be that rule that we just talked about there. All right, so why don't you try naming some of these, and since I jumped the gun on that last one, I will change it, and we'll do a different one. Let's do, uh, let's do this one here. Do that, and while you're at it, why don't you write the formula for these names? Let's do, uh, Calcium nitride, let's do aluminum oxide, and let's do let's do potassium phosphide. All right, left hand side. Proper name, right hand side, proper formula. All that good stuff. I think I might even be missing one on this slide. There you go.
Okay, so let's take a look and see how we're doing. We'll start with the first one. So again, we see a K, which is potassium, that's a metal. Cl is chlorine, that's a non-metal. Again, always our first guy here, our metal, that's the important guy. That is group one. Uh, so that automatically tells us it's a type one compound. So we're just gonna use the whole name there of the metal, which is potassium and chlorine becomes chloride at the end. This is made up again of two ions, the cation being the K plus and the anion being the Cl minus in this particular case. Coming to our next one, we have Zn, which is zinc, which is a metal. S is sulfur, which is a non-metal. Zinc is a transition metal, but it is one of those transition metals that does have a fixed charge. So it will fall into the type one category. So again, we're just gonna use the whole name there, which is zinc and sulfur becomes sulfide IDE. Again here, the uh, zinc with a plus two charge is our cation and the sulfur with a minus two charge because it's group six is our anion. Also why we just need one of each of those to make the formula that we see as plus two and minus two balance out to zero. Coming down here to the one I changed, which is MGS. Again, MG being magnesium, which is a metal. S obviously, which is sulfur, still a metal. And magnesium group two, which means it has a fixed charge. So that's gonna be magnesium. And again, become sulfide. Cation here going to be our magnesium with a plus two charge anion going to be our sulfur with a minus two charge in this particular case. Now coming here at the end, we have Ba, which is barium, which is a metal, and we have H, which is hydrogen. And remember that hydrogen is a non-metal actually. And in this particular case here, um, we would name it the whole name, which would be barium. Hydrogen at the back end there is the negative version which would be hydride. So this would be barium hydride. Again, barium being group two would be our cation. And our anion in this case would be H minus. Let me get our anion there. Any question on any of those names there? Okay. So when we have the name, but want to write the formula again, the basic thing that you wanna do is just get the basic components that make those things up. So we see calcium here. So that tells us it is a metal and calcium is group two. So we should have a plus two charge. Nitride is nitrogen, which is group five and group five on the periodic table there is a minus three charge. So again, when we put these together, we wanna to make sure that we end up with no charge overall. So common number between both of those is six. So to get my calcium to a plus six charge, I need three of them. Each at plus two gives me a plus six. And to get my nitrogen to a negative six, I need two of them. Again, minus three, minus three gives me a negative six. And that would be the correct formula. Some people do the crossover move there and it works most of the time, about 90% of the time, does not work 100% of the time. So if you're good with like 92%, you could just randomly cross it over the charges down, you know, it'll be all right, I suppose. Uh, but much better to probably do it the right way and make sure that everything works out, you know, so you get the right answer there. Uh, looking here at aluminum oxide, aluminum is uh, group three, so it has a plus three charge. Oxygen group six has a minus two charge. Again, when we put that together, we want to make sure that we get to zero. So six again, here's our common number. And that means that we need two of the aluminums and three of the oxygens for Al2O3. Again, another one you could kind of cross over and it'll be okay. And lastly, here we have potassium, which is group one, has a plus one charge. We got phosphorus or phosphide. Uh, phosphorus is group three. So that has a minus three charge. Again, in this case, we need more of the potassium. We need a grand total of three of them to get us to plus three on the left and one of the phosphorus on the right. So that basically says we have one phosphorus at minus three, 
and three of these potassiums, each at plus one, gives us a plus three, minus three, everything is balanced. Question on type one ionic compounds, how to write the proper formulas, name the names. Any questions on that there? Okay. So then that will bring us to the next type of compound that we're going to name, which is sometimes referred to as a type two binary compound. Binary compound means pretty much two elements involved. Um, that's pretty much what it means. And in a type two compound, it is also a metal and a non-metal. So it again is an ionic compound that we're talking about here. So same situation is going to occur. Our metal again is gonna transfer that electrons over. And much like type one, it is the metal that's still the most important guy is going on. And the metal here will be a transition metal. Are just to the right of the transition metals on the periodic table below the staircase. So these are guys like, for example, tin, lead, bismuth, antimony, and that sort of area. So kind of below that staircase where you have non-metals above, but metals on the bottom. So although they're not technically transition metals, uh, they are kind of named the same way. And what all these guys pretty much have in common is the fact that these metals can have a variable charge. So it does depend on the situation for these guys as to what the charge would be. So for example, something like copper, in certain cases could be copper one, in certain cases it could be copper two. Something like iron could be iron two, iron three. So it does have a variable type charge. The good news is Whatever it's attached to, you will know what the charge is. So you could kind of work your way backwards to figure out what the charge is on uh, the particular metal that you are looking at. So <clears throat> if we look at one, for example, uh, FeCl2, when we look at this, we see Fe, which is iron. It is a metal, and we find it dead smack in the middle of the transition metal region. Cl is our non-metal. So as soon as we sort of see it in the back, we do know that it could have a variety of charges. So what we want to do is sort of figure out what is the charge on that one iron. The good news is we do know that the non-metal here is group seven, and it has a minus one charge, and there's two of them. So if I just draw it all out there, that means that I have a negative two happening here for our chlorine. And that means to balance it out because it's still an ionic compound, our iron needs to have a plus two charge to do that. So what that means is when we go to name these guys, which are type two compounds, we do the exact same sort of format. We use the whole name of the metal. We also put the non-metal with the IDE at the end of it and drop the first part, our last part of it. And in the middle, we actually add Roman numerals. And what the Roman numerals indicate is the positive charge on the metal. So very common people screw that up because they think that the Roman numeral tells you how many metals there are, but is actually if you took the metal one metal out by itself, what the positive charge would be. So if I were to name this guy, it would be iron, Roman numeral two, and the last part is still chloride. So again, a couple of things about that, that Roman numeral two is the charge on our iron. That's where it comes from. And same thing as in type one, even though there's two of these guys here, no prefix or anything here. It is just chloride on the back end of the name. And the whole point of naming is to tell people what you're talking about. And the reason why we do that Roman numeral is if we had something like FeCl3, in this particular case, we would have one iron 
and three chlorides, which gives you a minus three overall. That means that the iron here is actually plus three in this compound. And the name of this guy would be iron Roman numeral three for the charge, chloride. So really naming is just about telling people what you are dealing with exactly. So because iron, for example, can have multiple types of charges depending on sort of what it is bound to, we need to tell people in this particular case, we're talking about iron with a plus two charge. In another case, we're talking about iron with a plus three charge. Question on type two type compounds here. So here's some of the transition metals and some of the variety of charges. Uh, so all these guys could have multiple charges. Nickel, for example, could be plus four. These guys though, are the ones that we talked about that really do have a fixed charge. So again, these guys here are more type one. But everybody else sort of rummaging through here. And again, sort of uh, in this area of the periodic table as well, you know, in the bismuth, antimony, this sort of area. This is what I was talking about to the right of the transition metals kind of below um, the staircase are also type two guys. I will say mercury is an interesting one. Uh, mercury, when we look at this guy here and this one here, these are two ions of mercury. Oddly, the one that has the most twos is actually mercury one. And the one that has the least number of twos is mercury two. And the reason for that is mercury one is actually a dimer, which means it's actually two mercury one guys kind of bonded together is how they come. So that's why there's the extra two. How do you recognize it in a formula? Usually this extra two is in the formula as well. So you can kind of see the extra two on the bottom. And that's how you could sort of recognize that you're dealing with the mercury one in a particular formula, you know, if you had something like uh, HG2O uh, versus HGO, yeah? So this guy has the extra two, which would tell you this is mercury one. This one here, no extra two on the bottom would tell you it's mercury two. So that extra two oddly helps you determine that it's mercury one. <laughs> Makes sense, I suppose, somewhere with somebody. Any questions on that there? So again, uh, we do use these Roman numerals, not how many metals we have, but again, the individual positive charge that we find on the metal. Now, if you're old like me, there's an older way of naming these sort of guys where they don't necessarily use Roman numerals or anything like that. They kind of go old school with it and it's kind of this common name. So something like copper one is known as cuprous, Something like copper two is known as cupric. Iron two is ferrous. Iron three is ferric. Just so you know how this sort of naming goes, the one with the larger positive charge ends in IC. And the one with the lower positive charge ends in OUS. As you can see here, iron two is OUS, ferrous. Iron three is ferric. Copper two is cupric. Copper one is cuprous. We won't use these, but they do pop up occasionally. And if you plan on taking, uh, what class is after this one, 200B? Yeah, you will see that again. Those older school names, when you learn about naming complex ions, they actually come up a little bit later on. But for our class here, we will stick to the systematic name with the Roman numerals as to how you should probably properly name these guys um, when you have a type two compound. So use the Roman numerals. We won't use sort of the older school type of way of naming. And again, if you plan on taking 200B, you will see those names pop up again in a wonderful chapter where you need the entire paper just to name one thing. It's like that way again, the name. All right, uh, let's see here. Why don't we uh, let me try some here and see what we got going. Um, so why don't you give the proper names here Maybe I'll add one to it as well. Let's go with that, PBO2. And I'll give you some maybe to write the formula. Let's go with uh, chromium.
okay, nickel four oxide and So uh, names on the left and formulas on the right. Let's see what you come up with. Okay, so let's see how we're doing. We'll start with the first one here. So we uh, see CO, which is cobalt. That is a metal and that is a transition metal. Um, and we got CL, which is chlorine, which is a non-metal. Again, our cobalt, which is a transition metal, should automatically tell you type two. So if you're not sure what it is, we do need to figure out what the charge is on the cobalt. We do know that we have three of the chlorides and each one is minus one. 
and that would give us a total of minus three if we added them all together. That means that we do need a plus three in this case to balance it out. That means we will use the whole name of the metal, which is cobalt. Our Roman numeral will be the charge on the metal, which is plus three. And again, even though we have three of the chlorines there, we just name it like there's just one and we put the IDE at the end of it and we get cobalt three chloride in this particular case. Any questions on that one there? All right, coming down here, copper, which is also a transition metal. Again, can tell us we need to figure out our charge on it. We have I, which is group seven. That means that the I has a minus one charge. So to balance it out here, the copper does need to have a plus one charge. That means that we would have copper Roman numeral one. Again, for the charge that's on the metal, and iodine becomes iodide, I-D-E, at the end of it. Rolling to the next one, which is SN. SN is 10, and BR is bromine, which is a non-metal. Again, the tin is not technically a transition metal, but it is that one of those guys to the right of the transition metals underneath the staircase and those guys are named the same way, which means that they do have a variable type charge. So same deal here, we only have one 10, but we do have four of these BR minuses. And again, that's gonna give us a minus four overall. So to balance that out here, the 10 does need to have a plus four charge. And this should be 10 Roman numeral four, again, for that charge. And the bromine becomes bromide, I-D-E. Any question on those so far? All right, looking down here, we have PB, which is lead, same deal, kind of right next to 10, actually right below 10 on the periodic table. Again, in that kind of area that also is named the same way as transition metals. Uh, so same deal, we don't know what the charge is on the lead here, but the oxygen is group six, which means it has a minus two charge, and we have two of them in this case. That is a minus four, which means here, lead has a positive four charge, and this is actually lead Roman numeral four oxide in this particular case. And this is a nice example of if you did the cross Saruski there, cross back over type of move, you will get the wrong answer in that particular case. So again, doesn't always work 100% of the time that crossover type move, you know, 92% of the time it does work. So better to sort of think about it and balancing the charge so you get the right one. Can't tell you how many people will write lead to oxide in this case. Uh, because of that, maybe some of you already did, yes. So again, make sure you kind of work it out so that you get the right answer. Any questions on any of those names there? What I got those, did I make them up? I probably did. Any of those questions? Okay. So now that we have the name, we want to go backwards. So usually when we want to go backwards, we just want to kind of think about basic units and put them together correctly. The nice thing about chromium, Roman numeral three is the name itself tells me what I'm dealing with. That is a chromium with a plus three charge. Again, that's what the Roman numeral means. Chloride is group seven that has a minus one charge. So in this particular case, when we put that together, we need more of the chlorides. We need a grand total of three of them. Should give us CrCl3 as our formula there. Coming down to nickel Roman numeral four, we know that's a type two compound. Again, same deal, the Roman numeral there in the name already tells me what the charge is, so I don't have to figure it out. Oxygen, again, is group six, which means it has a minus two charge. Again, uh, in this particular case, it would end up as NiO2 in this case. Also another situation if you did the crossover move would not work correctly, would give you the wrong formula. It would actually give you this formula, right? If you cross that over, you get Ni2 
04. Not completely all lost in that situation. If you remember what we were talking about with empirical formulas, empirical formulas, ionic compounds are always empirical formulas, which means you would need to reduce this down from a two to four ratio to a one to two ratio, which would give you to the correct answer here. So if you did cross over, if you just remember the ionic compounds are empirical formulas, the simplest whole number ratios, you actually could get to the right answer. Um, but again, just don't blindly go with the crossover move. Lastly, here we have bismuth three, which would be Bi three plus again from the Roman numeral. And here, this is nitrogen, which is group five, which is a minus three. So it looks like in that case, we just need one of each of those guys and we will have it. Question on type two, how to name them, how to write the formulas. Any questions on any of that stuff there? Okay. So uh, let's talk about then. This is sort of a decision tree of what to do in terms of naming when you have an ionic compound. Again, it will either be type one or type two. Again, if it's a type one, what that means, it's always the metal you wanna look at. So uh, we don't have to worry about Roman numerals or charges. Again, just the whole name of the metal, IDE on the non-metal name. If it's a type two, we do need to figure out what the charge is on the metal because it can't have a variable charge. And the only additional thing that we sort of do is we include a Roman numeral. Again, steal the whole name of the metal, ID on the non-metal, just that Roman numeral, which again indicates the charge on the individual metal, not how many metals that you have. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about then is polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are groups of non-metals. that have charges. And special names. And they are also, they are non-metals, which means they are basically held together through covalent bonding, but they do have an overall charge. So for example, if we look at something like NH4, NO3. If we look at this guy right here and we break it right about there, this is actually two different polyatomic ions that are together. This guy over here is probably the only positive polyatomic ion you will see, and that is NH4+. Plus. That one nitrogen and four hydrogens all stay together as a whole unit, move around as a whole unit, never break apart into individual elements, and all of that entire thing has a positive one charge. While when we look over here, this guy over here is NO3 minus. Again, that one nitrogen and three oxygens all stay together and basically move around as a whole unit. Never will break apart into individual nitrogens or oxygens or anything like that and has a minus one charge. And it is an ionic compound, so positive and negative. And we basically are putting together a plus one and a minus one, which is why we have in the formula just one of each of those to balance it out. And each of these have a special name. NH4 plus is what is known as the ammonium ion. Not to be confused with ammonia. This is ammonium ion. NO3 minus is the nitrate ion. And surprisingly, when you put those together, you put both of those names together, and this would be known as ammonium nitrate. So again, uh, each of these things are groups of nonmetals together. So really what we got going on here is we have our good friend NH4. All these guys are sharing electrons covalent bonding, just like we talked about when we drew our Lewis structures as an overall plus one charge. 
We also have nitrate, which just like we talked about, drawing our Lewis structures is this guy. Also has a negative one charge. So no sharing of electrons here. It is that positive and negative charge that holds these together. It's kind of a weird thing. You've got a covalently bonded guy that has a charge, so it's an ion. But the two of these guys coming together is essentially an ionic compound, positive and negative. Now, since NH4 plus is uh, pretty much the only positive guy that you see, a lot of times what happens with our polyatomic ions is that they end up being attached to a metal. We'll talk about what to do with those guys in just a second. So here is a list of some polyatomic ions. And for some reason, my four went way up on top there. So you should probably fix that or should be on the bottom. So again, this should be NH4+. plus. So here's uh, ammonium. Here's a bunch of guys that have a minus one charge, ones that have minus two charge and minus three charge. So the bad news is, of course, you do need to know these. Yes, so the best way is to memorize them. There are ways that you could kind of uh, group these guys together to help you memorize sort of these guys. If you look and we have something like uh, NO3 minus and NO2 minus, again, that one nitrogen, three oxygens with a minus one is nitrate. One nitrogen and two oxygens with a minus one is nitrite. Same thing if you look at sulfate, which is SO4, two minus, one sulfur, four oxygen with a minus two charge. And SO3, two minus, which is sulfite. Again, one sulfur, three oxygens. The only difference between these, which are sometimes referred to as a group of two, the only difference between these guys is the number of oxygens. And typically the one with the most oxygens in a group of two will end in ATE. Like you ate too much, more oxygens is a good way to remember it. The one with the least number of oxygens ends in ITE. So we see that sort of trait happening with a lot of these guys. That's a really good way to sort of memorize it. Same thing here, this is phosphite, PO3, three minus on the bottom. Phosphate, PO4, three minus. Again, the one with more oxygens ends in eight. The one with the least number of oxygens ends in eight. So that's a really good way to sort of uh, memorize these, sort of group them that way. Sometimes people will learn all the eights and know that the eights are one oxygen less or vice versa. You can learn all the eights and the eights are one oxygen more. That's again, sometimes a way people can do that. There is also unfortunately a group of four that are related to each other. And we see that kind of right here, just one group of four. And we have something like uh, ClO4 minus, ClO3 minus, ClO2 minus and ClO minus. They are all related to each other. They all have a negative one charge. The only difference is the number of oxygens. So if you broke it up right about there, everybody to the right would have the least number of oxygens, which means they should end in ITE. So this would be chlorite. This guy would also be chlorite. You obviously cannot have the same name for two different formulas. So when you have a group of four, the one that has the least number of oxygens ends in ITE also starts with hypo. So that is hypochlorite. And if we go the other way, these guys, the ClO4 minus, the ClO3 minus, they have the most oxygens, which means they should end in eight. So that's like chlorate. That's also like chlorate, but same deal. We can't have obviously the same name for two different things. So in a group of four, the one with the most oxygens in addition to ending in eight, we'll start with per. So that is per chlorate, chlorate, chloride, and hypochlorite. 
Now the CL is a halogen. You could actually substitute out the halogen for other halogens and they're named the same way. So that is hypobromite, bromite, bromate, and perbromate. You could also put iodide in there as well, get the same sort of situation that occurs. So again, in a group of four that are related to each other, eight for the guys with the most oxygens, the one with the most oxygens out of the group of four should also start with per, and the one with the least oxygens out of the group of four should also start with hypo and end with it. So those are some common groups of four that come across a lot. The chlorate, chloride, all those guys are very common. Another thing that you will sometimes see on here, for example, if we look at CO3, two minus, that is carbonate. And sometimes we put like an H plus in front of it. And if we do that, we get HCO3 minus. HCO3 minus, we basically put an H plus or a hydrogen in front of it. This is what is known as hydrogen carbonate. Hydrogen carbonate is also sometimes referred to as bicarbonate, which you might need right about now, but bicarbonate there is sometimes used the bi instead of the hydrogen. Also happens with sulfate. You could have hydrogen sulfate and bisulfate. So that's again, a very common sort of uh, rule as well. Now for a vast majority of everybody on here, it does end in either eight or eight but there are certain polyatomic ions that actually do end in IDE. OH minus, for example, is hydroxide IDE. We also have cyanide, CN minus, also ends in IDE, azide as well. And uh, that, by the way, the three should be on the bottom two, I believe it should be something like that. And uh, let's see here, we got uh, peroxide, O2, 2 minus is also another one that ends in IDE. But for the most part, things that end in IDE probably gonna be from the periodic table, the element, uh, but there are some polyatomic ions that essentially will end in IDE as well. So again, you, you do need to know these names, you do need to know the formulas, and more importantly as well, you do need to know the charges because that's gonna allow you to put everything together sort of correctly. So let's talk about what happens when we put these polyatomic ions together. Since a majority of them, like I said, are negatively charged, what usually happens is our polyatomic ions will end up with a metal. So usually we get a metal plus a polyatomic ion. And basically what happens with that is we basically follow the same sort of rules as the type one and type two that we were talking about earlier, which means again, the metal is the most important guy here. It is whether or not it needs a Roman numeral is based on its location. So we use the whole name of the metal. And again, I'll go with uh, the Roman numeral with a question mark, depending if it's type two, you need it. If it's type one, you don't need it. And then what we do for the polyatomic ion is we just use the whole name of the polyatomic ion. So for example, if I had NaNO3, when we would look at this, we would break it right about there. Na is sodium, which is group one, which is a plus one charge. NO3 is nitrate, which is a minus one charge. And again, that is why we only needed one of each of these. Plus one, minus one gets us to our formula. But again, it is the metal that's important. Since it is group one, it has a fixed charge. So we would use the whole name of the metal and we would use the whole name of our polyatomic ion. And this would be sodium nitrate. Now, if we had FeSO4, for example, we would break this apart right about there. This is iron, and we would wanna follow the same sort of logic as we've done before. It is a transition metal, which means it can have a variable charge. So we do need to figure it out. So once you memorize all these guys again, 
that is SO4 two minus, which is sulfate. And it has a minus two charge. That means in this particular case, the iron is a plus two charge. And we would name this iron. We would need the Roman numeral. And two, and this would be sulfate, the whole name of the polyatomic ion. Any questions on how to put those together? Okay, I'm gonna give you some maybe to try. I'm gonna just make up some fun stuff here, supposedly. Uh, let's go with uh, let's go with KCN. Let's go with uh, CaOH2. Let's go with. Um, Cu NO three two. Let's go with uh, go with that. You now let's do some names. So let's do. Uh, Do magnesium, hydrogen, carbonate. Let's do chromium for sulfate. Five. All right, so uh, names on the left and formulas on the right. See what you come up with.
Okay, let's take a look here. So uh, first one here, we have KCN. We would break it apart right there. Again, we see a metal. And again, really the metal sort of the important part here. So that is potassium, which we know is group one. It has a K plus charge, which would be our cation. CN is CN minus, which would be our anion and a polyatomic ion. So really because the potassium here is the type one metal, we don't need any Roman numerals or anything like that. So we're just going to use the whole name there, which is potassium. And again, just the whole name there of our polyatomic ion, which is cyanide. So potassium cyanide in this particular case. Looking at our second one here, again, we would break it apart right about there. Looking over here, we have a metal, which is calcium. That again is the important part there. That is group number two. And what that means again is that our calcium should be a positive two charge. Now the polyatomic ion here is hydroxide, which is OH minus. And that is why we do need a two here of them. Also what we see is when we have more than one polyatomic ion, we do need to put parentheses around it. Because if we wrote CaOH2 like that, it would imply that we just have two hydrogens and one oxygen, which is not what we're trying to do. So whenever you have more than one polyatomic ion, you do need those parentheses around it to indicate how many you have. Uh, so calcium, which is group two, fixed charge. So just the name there, which would be calcium. And even though we have two of our polyatomic ions, it doesn't affect the name. We just use the name of the polyatomic ion. So this would be calcium hydroxide. Again, no prefix or anything like that. People always want to use prefixes everywhere. Yes. Any questions on those first two? Okay, so then uh, Cu, which is copper. Again, we would break it right about there. Copper being a transition metal tells us it could have a variable charge. So we do need to kind of figure out the charge uh, of what it is there on the copper. When we look in the parentheses for our polyatomic ion, that is nitrate, which is a minus one. And again, we have two of them, which gives us a grand total of minus two. That means in this particular case, our copper should be plus two. And to balance that out, since it is a variable charge, we are gonna go copper here. We do need the Roman numeral since it is a type two type compound for the charge. And again, even though we have multiple nitrates there, we just use the whole name, does not affect the name of it. And that would be copper two nitrate in this particular case. Any questions on that one? And lastly here, looking at Ni, which is nickel, also a transition metal, uh, which means we do need to figure out the charge on it. Here we're going to look in our parentheses for our polyatomic ion, and that is ClO, which is ClO minus. That was one of the group of four that we just talked about. And that is hypochlorite is what that is. But since there's four of them, that would give us a minus four charge happening. If we drew out all of them. That means over here, our nickel should be a plus four in this case. And putting all that together in a name, we would go with nickel. Here we would need a Roman numeral uh, to indicate the charge. So this would be nickel Roman numeral four for the charge on the metal. And again, even though we have a bunch of those CLOs, we're only gonna use the name of it, which would be hypochlorite. So nickel four hypochlorite. Any question on any of those names there? So obviously working backwards from the name like we normally do, we want to start with the basic units. So Mg is magnesium. So that is magnesium is group two. So that should have a plus two charge. Hydrogen carbonate is the same as bicarbonate. 
that is HCO3 minus, again, uh, all that entire thing has a minus one charge. What that means is we actually need two of the bicarbonates to balance it out. And that would give us a formula Mg. Since we have more than one of the polyatomic ions, we do need parentheses, HCO3 parentheses and the two on the bottom. What that means is that two means we have two of these guys here at minus one each gives us a minus two and that bounces out with our plus two. Coming to our next one here, which is chromium Roman numeral four. Again, the Roman numeral here tells us what the charge is on the chromium, so we don't have to figure it out. Sulfate is SO4 two minus. So ultimately we're putting together something with a plus four and a minus two. So we actually need two of the sulfates to balance it out. And that would give us a formula of CR again, multiple polyatomic ions going to require parentheses, SO4 and the number on the bottom there for how many we need. That says we have two sulfates at minus two each, gives us a minus four and one chromium at plus four. We are nice and balanced in that particular case. And lastly here we have ammonium and we have sulfide. So ammonium is NH4 plus. And sulfide is actually just from the periodic table. That is sulfur. That is group number six, they say, I think, which is minus two. Slapping those together carefully. We need more of the ammonium here, which would be one more to get us to a plus two to balance it out. Again, because the ammonium is our polyatomic ion, we got more than one. We're going to need a parentheses around it and an S at the end. Any questions on polyatomic ions, how to write the formulas, put them together? Again, here you do not see any prefixes unless it, the name itself has a prefix. But other than that, again, no use of prefixes or anything like that. So I would say probably most of the time, that's how your polyatomic ions will really shape up again, because there's not very many positive polyatomic ions. So they usually do end up with a metal. So you really default back to your type one and type two sort of situation. Any questions on polyatomic ions? Okay. That then brings us to acids. And acids are substances that basically can produce uh, H plus in solution. And I think based on the time, we will lay it up there, I think, for right now. So what we're going to do, I think we're almost done with our naming. So we will do a little bit of lecturing at the beginning of the lab to finish up the naming. And that will go good with today's sort of lab, which is the study assignment, which is on naming as well. So instead of stopping kind of a mid-acid talk, never want to stop a mid-acid talk, I suppose, um, we will continue on at the lab at 7.15. So uh, we'll stop here for right now. Any questions on anything? A reminder as well, I believe we do have a quiz coming up on Thursday on Lewis structures and all that stuff. Uh, so everything involving bonding from Lewis structures to formal charge, to geometry, all that kind of stuff. Again, uh, just to kind of get you remembering all that stuff for the exam that's coming up, I think in a couple of weeks or so from now. So, all right, so I'll see everybody at 7.15. We'll wrap up the rest of this, then off to the, um, off to, uh, the study assignment. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I had a little trouble with the recording. It'll be up uh, soon, either tonight or tomorrow. I'll have the last uh, recording up there. All right, guys, I'll see everybody in a bit. Make sure you put here if you haven't done so. I'll see everybody at 715.